Love makes us better than we are. Be passionate about the things you love. T.D. Jakes, if you can't figure out your purpose, figure out your passion, for your passion will lead you right into your purpose. Albert Einstein, fairly smart guy. I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious. It's pretty good for a guy who apparently couldn't match his socks from what they say. And then John Wesley said this, Light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles to watch you burn. Funny story. Pastor, new pastor comes into this town and he's trying to evangelize everybody and get everybody in church. And, you know, people who used to come to church, he goes and visits them and tries to get back. There's this one man who literally lives across the street from the church. And he's asked about this guy. He's knocked on this guy's door. The guy won't give him the time of day. He, he's invited the guy. He's sent him cards. He's sent him letters. He's made phone calls. Nothing, 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 nothing. He's to the point where he's like, man, yeah, forget it. One night, there is a fire at the church. The pastor, of course, comes over from the pastorium, and he's standing there, and the firemen are there, and some other people are gathered. And then as he turns around, he sees that the guy from across the street has come across the street and is standing in the church parking lot for the first time ever. A little, a little PO'd about this, he kind of walks over to the guy. Hey, Mr. So-and-so. Uh, all these years I've been inviting you to come to this church. And uh, why, why, pick, why, why pick today to come and show up at our church? Your church has never been on fire before. Think about that. Some churches have never been on fire to where people are not coming to watch them burn. People aren't coming to see what's going on. People are like, that's, you know, yeah, that, it's a pretend fire. How many of you all... Uh, I grew up in South Florida. Our chimney was made out of cardboard. We'd pull it out of the attic. We'd fold it. We'd unfold it. Um, there was a little light. There was a little cup that went around the light, and there was this little fan. And so as the light heated the air, the fan would turn, and so you had a realistic-looking flame. Yeah. <laughs> Not a whole lot of people wanted to stand and drink cocoa and watch our fireplace, okay? Because it wasn't a real fire. Light yourself on fire with passion, people will come from miles to watch you burn. All right, what's, what's God's Word got to say to us today? Um, if you've got your Bible, if you'd like to, you can turn with me to uh, the book of John. John chapter 4. No, we're not going to spend forever in the book of John. We're just taking this one little, one or two verses in here. John chapter 4, verses 34 through 37. Jesus has uh, gone out of his way to talk to somebody that he wasn't supposed to talk to in a place he wasn't supposed to talk to them about a thing he wasn't supposed to talk to them about. Why? Because he was passionate about people. He was passionate about this woman who thought so low of herself that she was going from relationship to relationship to relationship. It's a light bulb moment, folks, whenever you go from the, st the f when you stop looking at what person is doing wrong to why are they doing that wrong thing. What lie do they believe that says to them, my only value is being used like this, or my only value is being used by this. When we can get beyond th saying, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, to I wonder why that person doesn't know they're worth more. What lie do they believe about themselves that makes them think they're not worth more than that? That's what Jesus did because Jesus didn't look at Jesus didn't look at the, the, the fact that she was she'd been married multiple times and she was living with somebody she wasn't married to. That wasn't his thing. What he wanted to do was get to the heart of the matter, which is to let her know her value in creation, her value in God, her value in in uh, in God's plan. So he's been sitting here. He's he's talked to her. He's like, uh, hey, go get your uh, go get your husband and bring him back. And I don't actually have a husband. He goes, well, you're you're right. You've had several, and the guy you're with now is not your husband. And she's like, oh, uh, where do you think we should worship? And you know, changing the subject. And so she wanders off. The disciples who have been uh, oblivious to all this stuff, they come back. And in John chapter four, verses thirty-four through thirty-seven, um, Jesus, they've offered Jesus. Some food and Jesus goes, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Okay? Don't you have a saying? Uh, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. 
they are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and the other reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. What's Jesus talking about? He's talking about, guys, if, if, you, could get your, if you could get your eyes off of the, the problem and look at the harvest, it would be really cool. Because, see, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the harvest. I'm not, looking at, I'm not looking at the problem. I'm looking at the harvest. Okay, now, if the harvest was ripe unto harvest... 2,000 plus years ago when Jesus was telling the disciples this, do you suppose it's still in ripe season? Are we still in harvest season? Yeah. And so uh, I, that, I just take that as an encouragement. But um, how many of y'all um, uh, we used to, um, the, called it cherry picking? It's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm gonna go talk to that person. No, not that person. I'm going to go talk. No, not that. No, I'm going to find somebody who looks... Well, at least they're carrying a Bible. That's, I'll go witness to someone who is carrying a Bible and looks like they're going to church. Okay, that, that could be a mistake. But sometimes we, we, we want to kind of... The field is wide into harvest. Just go out and start looking. But I'm not uh, trying to rewrite the Scriptures, but actually I am. I'm calling this a rewrite. I think that we could very accurately say, rewrite John 4.34 this. My passion, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What is the work of God? God created man and woman. He created them so that he could do what? Have a relationship with them. And then we mess things up. And then he said, you know what? I still want to have a relationship with them. And so my next work is to redeem them. And so Jesus has come to do the work of his father, which is the work of redemption. Guess what we get to do? We get to be part of the work of redemption. Well, who are we going to redeem? Anybody who's lost. That's your, that's your, that's your target audience. You know any lost people? No, I just, I live in the church, Mike. I just, I sleep under the church. I live under the church. I, I don't know any lost people. All right. So my passion, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus is so passionate about doing his Father's work that he's willing to, to give everything over to it. Um, the story of the woman of the well, Jesus speaks to someone he should have avoided and gave her the message of truth. He didn't condone her life, but he didn't condemn her either. Why? Because she was already condemned. We, we see a lot of people in the religious circles spend a lot of time condemning people. Uh, I told Sally, uh, you know, that Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck if. You, you, you might be a legalist if you've spent way more time talking about how much somebody is doing wrong than trying to encourage them to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, that's wrong, and that's, you can't do that, and you can't do that, and you can't do that. Let me tell you what you can do. You can have a relationship with the living King of kings and Lord of lords. And if you get into that relationship, you might begin to realize that other thing I was doing it doesn't have the attraction it once had for me. You know, I actually have realized I don't need to have some pretend, you know, experience over here because I'm actually having a real experience with Jesus. And Jesus is helping me have real experiences with other people. And, and I don't have to do all the things that I used to do to try to fill that gap, fill that void. So um, let's go back to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, um, Jesus is, uh, this is uh, one of those times where Jesus is giving a parable. And um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is. Jesus is talking to his disciples about um, real passion and what real passion looks like. Uh, and these people had passion. They just had the wrong kind of passion. Uh, so, so Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from the Father in heaven. 
So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to the Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So Jesus has given some pretty clear, clear directives here about what shows your real passion. My passion is I want people to know what a good person I am. Some of you can relate to that. My passion is that somebody come up and at the end of a job go, man, that was really awesome, pat, pat, pat. That's my passion. But what if that passion got replaced for, my passion is I just want to do what the Lord wants me to do. I just want to, I want to speak to people when he says to speak to people. I want to give to people when he says to give to people. I want to go and do something for somebody when, when they say, you know. And then, you, and, okay, so here you are. You're standing on the street corner and you're preaching and you're wanting people to notice how really, really religious and spiritual I am. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these long, beautiful prayers. Man, isn't that awesome? Okay, and that makes you feel a certain way. But then you follow the passion of Christ so that you go and you say to somebody, what does Jesus see when he looks at you? Well, here's what he sees. He loves you so much he was willing to give himself for you. And you see this huge man weep and go, I needed that. Okay, now how I felt when I did that was better than any pat on the back I've ever been given. Because I got to be part of the redemptive work of Christ. And somebody who already believes in Jesus. He already has a relationship with Jesus. And guess what? All of us, is there, is there some place in your heart and in your life where you, you, there's, a, there's a nugget of something that's not true that you sure wish you could replace that with what you know in your, in your mind? You know that Jesus really doesn't feel that way about me, but I, I still think he's still got to look at me every once in a while and go, Rrr. <laughs> Did you do that? All of us, no matter where you are in your spiritual walk, could use a word of encouragement from another brother or sister. Sometimes our word of encouragement comes from somebody who's not a brother or sister. Um, Sally and I got paid the biggest compliment ever. Um, a friend of hers that she'd grown up with, um, uh, she was at our house visiting, and, and uh, she goes, you know, your, you and Mike's problem is that you, you, let, you let this God thing uh, like, affect all of your life. <laughs> because to her, it's like, he, here's, here's church and God. That happens Sunday morning for those two hours. And then the rest is school, work, this, that, this, that. You know, everything's compartmentalized. And uh, I don't think she meant it as a compliment. We took it as a compliment. It's like kind of like one time somebody told us we were um, supposing on God. What is it? We were... We were presuming. We were presuming on God. And it's like, yes, we are. Thank you very much for noticing. Um, so now we're going to go over to this, um, this other thing that happens in, in the book of Mark, Mark 12. Uh, Jesus is teaching about how you do things in private. And this takes us into one of those times where he sits himself in the synagogue and he watches kind of what's going on because you can tell a lot by a person's passion by what they do, how they carry themselves, how they, how they act towards other people. And uh, so Jesus is there. Now, um, you remember uh, a couple of weeks ago when the Atmores were here and they were talking about that shrine and how it had this big metal tub out there so that when you threw your money in, it would make this, you know, whatever. It would make this loud noise as if to say, look at me, look at me. Of course, they said that all so wakes up the gods, you know, and the bigger the noise, the bigger the God, and, and you want to earn as much as you can. Well, that's not very far from what was going on in the synagogue. They had these beautiful, uh, you know, we use these glass things 
Um, if, if you never know, if you have a glass like this, if you set your cell phone down there with music playing, it gets really loud in your room. Um, <laughs> Because I always, when I'm in here setting chairs, I put my phone in there and I can hear really well. So it, it, it magnifies the sound. And these rich people were walking in 